Hi, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Mindset team that you can see here, um, Isabel Rosenthal, Vedika Kumar, Hope Cronman, Josmar Hernandez, Antonia, I would like to welcome you to our community and to our, our inaugural event. Um, just a quick administrative direction. Um, if you have a question, please type it in the chat and the five of us will respond to you and we may ask you to come on camera at the end. Um, we probably won't have time to get to all the questions, but we can certainly discuss them tonight at our social hour, which we hope to see you all at from 5.30 to 6.30. Mindset stands for Mount Sinai Psychedelic Education. And this is part of the educational arm of our new Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research at Mount Sinai that has just been started by Dr. Rachel Yehuda. I'm going to introduce Dr. Yehuda to introduce our speaker, uh, but I'd like to start this series by something she said a few years ago. I'm gonna quote it. Openness to new ideas requires courage and vigilance. It is unfortunately often the path to most resistance. What we really need to be are disruptors, disbelievers, skeptics, and revolutionaries. These are the required ingredients of transformative change that will advance the field of trauma and the treatment of trauma survivors. Without further ado, my esteemed mentor, Dr. Rachel Yehuda. Oh, thanks, Lauren, um, for uh, sharing that quote. I'm actually thrilled to be introducing uh, Rick Doblin as our inaugural speaker of the Mindset Lecture Series sponsored by Mount Sinai Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research. Um, we're all, um, I don't think that we would be here if not for Rick. Um, I think he's been the inspiration of the center and we're all in for a treat. Um, Rick Doblin is the um, founder and executive director of MAPS, the uh, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. He has a PhD from the Kennedy School of Public Health. Um, and the story of how Rick started MAPS and how he has succeeded in bringing uh, this treatment through breakthrough status with the VA, with, with breakthrough status being granted by the FDA uh, is really one of the best stories in psychiatry today and certainly uh, one of the best stories in PTSD. Um, and to me, it's particularly inspirational because this is a story about somebody who is doing the right thing for the right reasons, even when it's very hard and people initially were really not on his side and particularly not the government and slowly walking through all the obstacles with just tireless energy, with passion, with patience and with, um, with a real commitment to the people who are gonna benefit from uh, this therapy. And um, of course, Rick is known for his generosity, um, especially in encouraging people like me to learn more about MDMA. So throwing it right back at you, Rick, um, you've been an inspiration because it has been hard to get where you are. And if you've been, if you can do it, we can all <laughs> help you. And that's really been um, where, where we're at. Um, we hope to help by providing really good science about this work uh, to go hand in hand with your efforts. What you've done for the um, entire field of trauma is give us a lot of hope that we can bring healing. Um, and I'm sure within the next few moments, it'll be clear to everyone, all the amazing efforts. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Rick Dublin. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, correct one thing is it's the Kennedy School of Government, not public health. So and, and the reason, no, no, the, <laughs> but the reason that I had to um, go to the School of Government is that the politics was blocking public health. And so I think one of the most important things we're trying to do is get it back into the field of public health. And I think one of the most important things to get the politics out of this is the study inside the Bronx VA and moving to get the VA and eventually the Department of Defense all interested in, in um, moving forward in this sort of research and that that will be, you know, incredible sign of uh, this move beyond the stigmatization and the politics and into really science and public health. So I'm going to do a presentation uh, PowerPoint. There is going to be um, a video of uh, 10 minutes of an MDMA PTSD uh, series of therapeutic sessions so you can really see directly how it works. And so I'll, uh, and then we'll have time for questions. 
Um, now, since we're talking about mindset, um, what I wanted to do is, is start with a little bit about uh, cultural mindset, um, just so that, um, oops, sorry. Okay, so um, the first thing is to look at this slide. This was a psychedelic looking slide and it was presented and created by the FDA, the Division of Psychiatry. And they presented this um, about a year and a half ago at the American Society for Clinical Psychopharmacology. And what they announced at this uh, conference is that they're creating a guidance document for sponsors of research interested in psychedelics. So when the FDA starts creating a guidance document and starts using uh, psychedelic looking slides like this, um, you know that uh, change is afoot and that there's support from the, the FDA, which I think is <clears throat> the most critical element in the entire um, psychedelic renaissance that we're having has been the FDA's willingness starting in 1992 to really open the door to psychedelic research. Um, just to give you a sense of really how things are going, uh, this chart of, uh, from the Web of Science psychedelic publications shows that we are now at a stage where there is vastly more papers being published about psychedelics than even in the height of research in the um, late 60s, early 70s. So that the science is really moving forward in an incredibly great way. Um, one of the things that's contributed to this um, openness, I think, has been the development of uh, S-ketamine and Spravato, which I, I know has been connected a lot to Mount Sinai, that this has been um, very inspirational. It's considered to be among perhaps the most important new development in psychiatry in the last um, several decades, and that it has catalyzed um, hundreds of treatment centers to being set up around the country to deliver this. Um, the one concern I I'll just raise is that um, I think that it would be more effective with psychotherapy, but uh, in general, pharma doesn't really understand psychotherapy. They understand psychopharmacology. So this is um, a drug that is administered under direct observation by a healthcare provider in a treatment context, but there are, is no psychotherapy. And, and there are some of the practitioners now <clears throat> without funding from uh, Janssen are funding their own studies to compare um, Spravato with and without psychotherapy. Um, but, but I just want to credit the, the development with ketamine has been a big factor with S-ketamine to create the, the current context of openness to what we're doing with MDMA and what other people are trying to do with psilocybin. <clears throat> There's been just enormous uh, media coverage um, spanning the, the entire um, political spectrum. Um, most recently, this was uh, the Washington Post Sunday Magazine, September 27th. Um, this was a cover article on um, who will benefit from psychedelic medicine. So it's about health equity, and it focuses on a training that MAPS conducted for therapists of color. One of the things that I really like about um, the opportunities with the Bronx VA is that you have therapists of color and you have a lot of patients of color. So I think it's going to be really important as we um, move to extend what we're doing to, to new populations. Um, <clears throat> the other sort of mindset context that we need to think about is that there's been the rise of um, for-profit psychedelic companies. Um, this was um, unheard of back in 1986 when I started MAPS uh, 34 years ago, and it's only been the case over the last couple of years that the political obstacles have been cleared out enough, the public support has grown, and also there's been more um, clear acceptance by regulatory agencies, particularly the FDA, for this sort of research. So now we have, these are three of some of the leading companies with uh, collectively a market cap of over 1.5 billion. So now this field has moving and we're gonna be making a case that um, we are supportive of all of this for-profit approach, but that there's advantages in having nonprofit actors in the space. And that's what MAPS is to kind of um, keep a check on some of the for-profit activities. Um, that, that may not be just about maximizing patient outcomes. Um, this is our corporate structure. MAPS is a nonprofit, uh, which I started April 1986. In December 2014, when it was clear that we were making progress with our research, that one day we might actually um, 
obtain FDA approval for their prescription use of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, we started the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, December 2014. And the purpose of that is to do two things, is that first off, to communicate that we're anticipating success, um, at least we're planning for that. But the, but the other thing is to develop a new model for marketing um, pharmaceuticals where the public benefit is maximized, not profit. So selling MDMA for a, a profit, which we do intend to do, um, will generate income that can then be used for the mission of the nonprofit MAPS, and this will supplement philanthropy. So it's been important for our donors to hear that we have a sustainability plan in mind. And so the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation will sell MDMA by prescription if we get approval. Um, that will be taxable, um, but the 100% owner of the Public Benefit Corporation is the nonprofit MAP. So we have a nonprofit owning a public benefit, and then we will market maximizing public benefit, not profit. And the reason that we can do this, um, where there's even this possibility that it doesn't go immediately generic, is Ronald Reagan in 1984 signed a bill to create incentives for developing drugs that were off patent. And those incentives are called data exclusivity, which means if you're the uh, able to make a drug into a medicine that has been, um, the drug is off patent or there's no use patents, um, no one can use your data for a period of five years to market a generic. And we're being required by FDA in phase four, if we succeed in adults to do studies in adolescents with trauma, uh, 12 to 17 year olds. If that works, we have to go down to 11 to 17 year old. I mean, seven to 11 year olds. You get six months data ex exclusivity extension for that. And then it blocks a generic competitor from um, applying to become a generic competitor for the five and a half years, it takes FDA at least six months to review. So it's essentially a six year period. Other companies, if they wanted to, can develop their own data. <clears throat> we have exclusive right to use our data, but it doesn't block anybody else from generating their own data, although it'll take them five years or so and cost them a lot more than it costs us, so it's not that likely. Um, and in Europe, it's 10 years. So this is the context. Um, since its founding, we've raised over 100 million in donations, which is a rather astonishing amount of money, and it's from the full range of um, people across all the political spectrum. Um, why MDMA and why PTSD? Uh, these are strategic choices. And because we are now the only uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in phase three, these strategic choices I think have uh, borne out, but um, MDMA is the most gentle of all the psychedelics. It's the easiest to integrate. It's the least ego dissolving. Um, it's the least uh, fear producing. Um, this, there's not so much a sense of losing control. So MDMA is the gentlest of all the psychedelics. And um, why PTSD? Um, we needed a patient population that was appreciated by the American public to get over the stigmatization. We needed a, a, a clinical condition for which it was um, generally accepted that there was a large number of people that were treatment resistant that needed help and that the available medicines and therapies helped some, but still left a, a great perceived need there. Um, this is the latest statistics that I'm aware of from more than two years ago when there was 1,039,000 veterans receiving uh, disability for PTSD. Um, I'm not sure what the number is now, but I, I imagine it's, it's larger than that. Um, third most prevalent service-connected disability after uh, tinnitus and hearing loss. Um, the last uh, estimate, this is my rough guess of what it costs the VA. Uh, we've been unable to get the exact numbers here, but it's in the range of 10 to 20 billion a year that the VA puts out for disability payments. Um, the only reference I could see was congressional testimony by a senior VA official in 2004, where the, it was a $20,000 average annual cost for disability payments for vets with PTSD. So assuming that it's the same with over a million, that's on uh, disability for PTSD, that's the upper 20 billion, but who knows, it's, it's just a massive um, financial cost, but more importantly, uh, an emotional cost to all these people that, that are still um, disabled to some extent with, um, with PTSD. 
Um, John Lubecki was one of the vets that was in our study. He said, I cannot emphasize how much treatment changed my life. I went from constant daily suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression to all, almost nothing. The best part, this was not a, um, a lifelong uh, treatment and medication. So I think that that's really important that we're talking about a short-term um, intensive intervention that's designed to make people um, not need the treatment anymore. Um, um, most of the, the veterans get most of the attention, but most of the people that have PTSD are women from um, uh, sexual assault, rape, abuse, childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence. And one of them spoke about MDMA as the peace drug. Um, and uh, this was in the Washington Post. Uh, before, I knew the path was through a battlefield, but I could not get through it. During MDMA therapy, I knew I could walk through it and I wasn't afraid. MDMA gave me the ability not to fear. Um, now, I'd like to now just play this um, 10 minute video just to give you a sense. I think the best way that you could get a sense of what MDMA assisted psychotherapy is, is to <clears throat> have a, a brief view of this actual therapeutic approach. This was a, a Marine veteran, two tours in Iraq, as you see, Humvee turret gunner. Um, this starts out the middle of his first MDMA session and it's um, some other sessions as well. Um, and so I, th I think this is a terrific educational tool for you to see. Are you ready to take your capsule? All right. Sure. <laughs> we'll just start it over again. Be fine. I just wanted to tell y'all, I had this like, um, this really intense like feeling come over my body and my heartbeat started beating real fast, but I didn't get, at, at first like I started feeling like a little afraid, but then once I started breathing, I, and I've never felt that before, like I literally felt my heartbeat start to slow down and everything when I started breathing and just relax and like mm -hmm. sensation and it was amazing how not quickly it went away, but just how in control I felt of mm. making it go away. So mm. right. usually I've, I've had those feelings. Mm -hmm. In a way, it kind of felt like when a panic attack kind of comes on mm -hmm. and my heartbeat started and I felt my whole body flush and mm -hmm. get really hot. And then mm -hmm. I was just amazed how I was able to not really fight it, but mm -hmm. kind of relax. I don't know, think about it now, when I got blown up myself. I, uh, I don't know, I see it completely different now. I, thinking about it, I really, that moment that I got blown up, when it was happening and everything was moving so slow and my mind was just racing at the speed of light. It was, and I can really go back and visualize it. I've never been able to visualize it so hard before. I can mm -hmm. really feel what it was like and there was this sometimes how much it hurt.
you just open the door and like it's locked. Like, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's no part of this integration process. It's really just what we're doing, you know. Really mm-hmm. being able to talk about that and express that and address the fear and support you in processing all that. And then what what you know you'll in that process I'm sure you'll find that actually as you knew yesterday it was helpful in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I can believe that because of just from the first experience and then the beginning of this other experience how things unfolded. Yeah. And they felt so natural mm-hmm. and very you know, healing and it was just like uh, you know, it's like doing some some house clearing, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know what I was thinking. I could clean the house out and not touch some of the stuff that's in the air. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> you can avoid a corner. Yeah. 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 I just feel like I should tell y'all something. I was just really amazing. Uh, it's hard to put it in words. Uh, that aspect of me that's just really rageful and also besides that image I told y'all about of, you know, the fighting with them. I had this image of it like in a jail cell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like mm-hmm. I had that mm-hmm. part of me is locked up in jail mm-hmm. and it's just, you know, got it's dark but it's got, you know you know bright red eyes and, and just really evil. And I thought of that and I felt like so I felt like I put that person there and I went to it and just opened the door and like hugged that person and then the eyes just faded away and it no longer had kind of an evil look to itself and like we like I visualized both of us just taking apart the jail cell and just you know like really becoming friends and then I visualized I visualized that image I told you about of me, like it coming out of my hips and it stabbed me in the side and everything. Mm -hmm. And I just had a strong visualization of me like reaching up where the knife was in my side and taking it out. And like, I took my hands off of its neck and didn't choke it anymore and just like really embraced it. And like, I don't know, I feel like I don't know, I, part of me realizes that I think that I was taking that person and, and keeping him locked up because I was so afraid of him and then that by putting him in that cell and keeping him locked up that I was just making it worse for him. Mm. And I was mm. it really more beneficial if we kind of work together and mm-hmm. I be I never realized how much I I thought I was being the peaceful person, but I didn't realize how much I was punishing that 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 aspect of me. Mm. Mm. I think I was just I think maybe in Iraq I saw what it was capable of. And I think I was too afraid to mm. you know, and a part of me just feels like so bad that I I did that to him mm. I, mean, I mean I know it's me but I just mm-hmm. describe yeah. it wisely Who are you? Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know I just got this amazing sense of just I guess wisdom I, I really don't know mm. Mm. sounds a lot like wisdom to me I know, it, was, it was really amazing and even when I try and think of that really rageful aspect of me, like I can't even, I know it's there, but it just doesn't, if, 
I really feel like so much more at peace with like mm -hmm. everything. Great. Like, even if I try and think about Iraq and everything, like I somehow feel like really peaceful about the fact that that's my journey and that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Part of me think. I mean, I mean, I know this is um, part of the, um, you know, part of the drug. But when I try and think, you know, am I going to be able to hold on to this, um, this understanding and this um, somewhat of wisdom, this knowledge that I have now? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just asking myself that question, I feel like it's so profound that I don't think I could really forget it. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, really I don't know why I couldn't have come up with this on my own, but I'm, I'm glad I... I'm glad I found it. Mm. I'm glad too. So, um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of how the therapy is working. Um, around uh, of the eight hour session, around half the time people are having their internal experience uh, with their eyes closed with the eye shades and music. The other half of the time they're talking to the therapists um, in a sort of interdirected, non scripted way. People find their own rhythms for that. Um, this is the phase three uh, study design that we negotiated with the FDA. It takes about three and a half months. It's a um, three MDMA sessions or three sessions with uh, therapy with inactive placebo. Uh, MDMA sessions are roughly one month apart. And there's uh, 12 90 minute non drug psychotherapy sessions, um, three before the first uh, experimental session for building the therapeutic alliance for preparation, and then three of these um, 90 minute psychotherapy sessions after each session for integration. Um, and then to prepare for the next one. And then our uh, primary outcome measure is two months after the last experimental session. Um, you may be wondering um, about this idea of uh, the inactive placebo and the double blind. Um, we tested all these different doses looking to try to figure out how to do a proper uh, successful double blind experiment. A lot of my dissertation at the Kennedy School was about this methodological concern of how to do a double blind study. Um, the solution I came up with was therapy with low dose MDMA with therapy with full dose MDMA. And the goal was to try to find the low dose that was sufficient to produce blinding, but that didn't have so much therapeutic potential that it'd be difficult to find a difference between the two groups. This is where we found the most effective dose range. Um, and what we found though was that the low doses uh, did help produce blinding, but they made people uncomfortable and it reduced the effectiveness of the therapy itself. Um, we did, uh, for those concerned about neurotoxicity, we did uh, neuropsychological measures before and after on two different uh, sites with two different neuropsychologists and we showed no uh, declines, even in some cases, slight increases. Um, so there's no evidence of uh, functional consequences and we believe that the doses that we're using are um, below the no effect level for neurotoxicity. Um, and even if there were some, it's a risk benefit, but uh, we don't see the risk here from that. What we learned in phase two is that we could enroll people with PTSD from any cause, that the low doses <clears throat> do have um, the ability to enhance blinding, but they have this anti-therapeutic effect. Um, the safety in clinical settings we demonstrated and we had a medium to large effect size. Um, we also did a, a mystical experience questionnaire. You may have heard that in the work with LSD and psilocybin, there's a correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes. And we use the same questionnaire and people with active dose MDMA do score fairly high on this questionnaire. 0. 0.6 is meant to be a full mystical experience. So you do have more <clears throat> higher scores with the classic psychedelics, but these are um, pretty substantial. And we have a fair number of people that are uh, above the full mystical experience, but there is no correlation between the mystical experience and therapeutic outcome when it comes to MDMA for PTSD. 
I think that's really important for the fact that we don't steer the sessions towards this kind of experience. And also, I think it means that with fear extinction and memory reconsolidation, you have to, it helps if you are able to um, be in your your bi biography, your ego, and, and really remember the the traumatic memories. Um, uh, we have done uh, cost effectiveness studies, just uh, published in um, Plus One recently, and it shows that it's um, break even. And this was uh, after three years. This was based on our phase two data. Now for phase three, and, and what I'll be sharing with you is just um, unpublished data. So um, please keep it out of social media. Uh, you can know it, but you can share it with colleagues. But we're working on a scientific paper that we hope will be published in a couple of months. Um, so this part is that we negotiate with FDA two 100 person phase three studies. Um, FDA said to us that uh, we could prove, um, they felt that we could prove efficacy with fewer numbers than they wanted to see for safety. So we were permitted to do an interim analysis, but um, it would only be for sample size reestimation uh, if we needed to add subjects to get more statistical significance, but we wouldn't be able to stop the studies early. Um, we have um, 15 phase three sites, two in Israel, two in Canada, and 11 throughout the United States. Um, we obtained breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA. Um, there was one other drug that was given breakthrough therapy uh, for PTSD. It was called uh, Tan Maya by Tonics Pharmaceuticals. They failed their interim analysis in February. They were a um, uh, repurposed sleeping pill to try to help people not have nightmares. Um, we've negotiated with the European Medicines Agency as well. They've agreed to accept the FDA, accept the FDA methodology, uh, approve a similar methodology in Europe where we have to do one pivotal study with 70 people and they requested we enroll refugees and migrants in the study. Um, Dr. Dublin? Yeah? Hi, this is your friendly 10 minute warning. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so these are the sites in, uh, in Europe. Um, we also have expanded access, compassionate use for 50 subjects. And also in Israel, we've got expanded access, open access, they call it for 50 more subjects there. Um, <clears throat> how it'll be regulated post-approval <clears throat> is that because it's not the drug, it's not Spravata, it's not the drug, it's the therapy that the drug enhances. So people who want to prescribe it and want to train, treat patients will need to be trained in the therapeutic approach. It will be only administered in certified clinics under direct supervision, centralized pharmacy that ships to uh, the prescribers, not to the patients, and the safety screening for certain populations. The things under the dotted line may be required by FDA patient registry and a total lifetime limit of doses, but we're not sure about that. But I, I think this is very reassuring to FDA, DEA, that it's um, going to be easy to, easy to regulate. Um, <clears throat> the interim analysis was great. It said that we didn't need to add anybody. <clears throat> and then we had a 90% or greater probability that we would generate statistically significant results with at least a medium effect size. Um, but this was right around the time of COVID. And then we stopped being able to enroll. And the FDA approached us and other sponsors and said, if you want to um, end your studies early, we're willing to negotiate with you. We did come to agreement to um, end with 90 instead of 100. And um, we completed the data lock and efficacy analysis on October 30th. Um, the, we enroll the hardest cases. We enroll people that have previously attempted suicide. Um, the people had chronic severe PTSD, an average of uh, over 20 years. Um, we had one subject that had PTSD for 63 years. And that subject uh, was randomized to the MDMA group and did have clinically significant reduction of PTSD symptoms. So no matter how long people are stuck in these PTSD patterns, they, they can still heal. Um, we had in phase three, um, 90 subjects, as I said, 57 were women, only two of those women were veterans, and we had 31 men, um, and 13 of those were, were veterans as well. Um, principal cause of PTSD was mostly, as I said, around 60% were women, was sexual trauma, um, domestic violence, um, also witnessing death, death threats. Uh, um, this is the, the results between the top line is um, therapy without MDMA. The bottom line is therapy with MDMA. Um, you can see there's great separation there. Um, and in practice, people are gonna get therapy plus MDMA. So 
while we have to do uh, placebo subtracted effect sizes and things like that, in practice, the uh, results will be uh, the bottom line. Um, uh, so in terms of effect sizes, these are the effect sizes of Zoloft and Paxil, which are the only drugs approved by the FDA for PTSD. Um, this was from our um, placebo, from our phase two data, we had 0.8 um, effect size in our pooled study. But in our um, phase three, we got uh, 0.91, which is subtracting the therapy from the therapy plus MDMA. So 0.91 is really the effect size of MDMA by itself. And the 2.1 is the effect size of therapy plus MDMA, which is the way it's gonna be delivered in practice. Um, oops, sorry. So this was uh, for one of our uh, potential donors uh, to talk about statistics. Uh, he, he likes uh, baseball. <laughs> uh, 0 0.5 is not significant foul ball. Uh, 0.05 is base hit. You're statistically significant. This is what you're looking for. Um, we are hoping for a home run, robust, very persuasive. That gives you the ability to negotiate with FDA somewhat. Uh, uh, but what we actually got was a grand slam out of the park. Where's the ball? Uh, P was 0 0.0001, one in 10,000 chance that it's uh, no more effective than placebo. Um, uh, we did enroll people on the dissociative subtype. We exclude people with uh, DID. And what we showed to our surprise was that the people in the dissociative subtype made more progress than the average severe chronic PTSD patient in the rest of the study. So this is demonstrating that it works best in the, in the hardest cases. Um, there are no effects by sight. This is really important. It's not the result of a few uh, extraordinarily gifted therapists. It's um, related to our therapy training program, but I think it's mostly related to the incredible therapeutic potential of MDMA. From a safety perspective, uh, on the right side, we had two people in the study um, that had serious adverse events. One of them attempted to kill herself twice and the other um, self-hospitalized because severe suicidal ideation um, made her want to protect herself from self-harm. And it turned out they were both in the placebo group. Uh, we had nobody in the MDMA group had serious adverse events. Um, we had equal amounts of suicidal ideation in the um, MDMA group as in the um, placebo group, equal numbers, but uh, fewer people in the MDMA group. Um, no problems with cardiovascular, uh, issues, one person in the placebo group, but not in the MDMA group. And no one spoke to us about using MDMA after the therapy was over. So we don't have evidence, at least at this point, of abuse potential from this. Um, these were the side effects that were um, reported. They're transitory. They're mostly during the acute effect, muscle tightness, decreased appetite, sweating, very trivial kind of side effects. Um, not problematic. So small p-value, large effect size. We replicated our phase two results, no size site variability and a great safety profile, no increase in suicidality. Our timeline is that we um, are starting our second phase three study now. We're gonna be having um, meetings in January with FDA to see if we can use this uh, very um, persuasive robust results and excellent safety record to um, expedite the, the drug development process, maybe skip the second phase three study or uh, go ahead without the control group. There are ethical issues about the control group. And so we're now anticipating with the current timetable, FDA approval um, early 2023, maybe that can be accelerated with European approval about a year later. Um, this is uh, what we're hoping to do here with uh, and planning to do this. Um, work with Rachel with, um, and your team with two sessions versus three sessions, kind of a cost effectiveness study. People do get better faster with three MDMA sessions, but at the 12 month follow-up, um, people continue to get better. So it could potentially be that even though people would get better faster with three sessions, maybe two sessions is enough to start the self-healing process. And then at the year follow-up, they'd be more or less the same. So this would make the, overall cost less expensive. And then we hope to also work on a group therapy study with Rachel and your team. This will be very important to develop. Um, we have done work with Candace Monson with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy, um, blending that with MDMA. And it worked great in our treatment development study. And now Candace is wanting to do a large controlled study um, 
this is basically to say that there's multiple different methods that can be used for MDMA. We have our own treatment method, but it can be blended with other uh, approaches and maybe there's ways to innovate and, and improve on what we're doing. And Wagner is going to be, who works with Candace, is going to be doing MDMA blended with cognitive processing therapy. Barbara Rothbaum at Emory is gonna blend MDMA with uh, prolonged exposure. Even Ed Nafoa is now willing to blend MDMA with uh, prolonged exposure in a study that will take place in, in Jerusalem. Um, this is an IIT at the Loma Linda VA. Uh, we are doing eating disorder studies um, that we're about to start. We've done social anxiety in autistic adults. That was great results. Uh, Life-threatening illnesses, people um, anxious about dying. This was very helpful. There's been a study with uh, Ben Sess in England, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for alcoholism with great results. We're doing a long-term follow-up from that now. Um, ben Kelmendi at Yale is gonna, for, for, for the first time, take somebody with PTSD under the influence of MDMA into a scanner. So it's not a treatment study, it's a, a mechanism of action study, but we are using the CAPS and we'll sort of see what MDMA can do on its own. And this is the vision for the future. There will be thousands of these psychedelic clinics and these therapists all want to be cross-trained, uh, not just MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine. And so I think that the future, I think for the Bronx VA and for the VA itself will be to get um, this, these MDMA studies started and see if that works. But eventually I, I do hope that we start developing sort of personalized medicine, personalized, customized psychedelic medicine, where you can design a treatment program for each person that may involve MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, and, and other things. And um, as the last slide, there are 8 million people in the US suffering from PTSD every year, but there's over 350 million in, in the world. And so now we are um, starting to um, expand our sites and to move towards um, Europe and the rest of the world. So that is a very quick uh, overview. And it looks like I even came in on time. Unbelievable. I don't know how that happened, but um, that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. And so I just very much look forward to the uh, discussion now. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we have a few questions coming in. So I think Tiffany is the first one if you want to kick us off. I'm still shocked I came in on time. <laughs> oh, I think you might need to unmute yourself, sorry. I'm so sorry, I thought I was, you could hear me this whole time. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was an accomplishment, I think, to finish right on time, so congratulations. But um, just wanted to say thank you for doing this talk. And my question, I've been really interested in microdosing, and I think it's interesting to see how microdosing has become sort of like a phenomena across psychedelics, not just MDMA. Um, and I'd love to hear what you know you can speak to regarding the actual therapeutic effect and also sustained effect post-dose um, and how that might be influenced by microdosing versus not microdosing. And I think my question specifically in the chat, which I'm sorry, I realized I was supposed to ask that one was about how do you decide on dosing based on someone's sort of baseline, um, psychologically speaking and otherwise? Yeah, um, the, well, I'll start with that. that. That's an easier question to answer is that um, we don't adjust the dosing based on their psychological conditions at the beginning. Um, the first session is 80 milligrams, uh, followed around two hours later by 40 to extend the plateau. Um, the second session is can be a negotiation between therapists and patients, but it generally will they'll go up to 120 milligrams, followed by 60 around two hours later. And the third session can also be a negotiation. But what we've seen is almost always the second and third sessions are higher. We do not um, dose based on body weight, that's pseudoscience. It doesn't really, but when you look at milligram per kilogram dosing, um, we did our first phase one dose response safety study that way. And you have a wider range of subjective effects when you base on body weight than when you have standardized dosing. So um, we don't really adjust. It's, it's more to common dosing for everybody. Microdosing, um, I think has a lot of benefits for creativity, for work-related things, for um, lifting mood, a bit, but in general, I'm, I'm not so sympathetic for therapeutic purposes. Certainly MDMA microdosing is not um, much of a thing. There are, there are some people that have microdosed MDMA for pain, 
on a long-term basis. They don't get the psychological effects, but MDMA is a good um, pain reducer. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a muscle relaxer as well. I think that may have something to do with the, the psychological feeling of relaxation, but microdosing for um, psilocybin and other things, there are some people with depression that find it helpful, but I would rather not have somebody dependent on a drug. When you're talking about microdosing, you're getting into like, this is a pharmaceutical drug. You need it every day. It controls your symptoms. It doesn't get to the core problem. So for psychedelics, for clinical conditions, I much more um, support macrodosing, full doses, intensive therapy, trying to get people to address the root causes so they don't need the drug anymore. But for you know, occasional creativity or, or work-related things, I think microdosing um, can be helpful. But there are a lot of reports that people have gotten um, benefit from depression, anxiety, and other things from microdosing. So I, I think it is worth exploring, um, but um, I, I much prefer, as I said, uh, fewer interventions, deeper with psychotherapy. Thank you. I think we have Isabel next and several more questions coming in here. Great, uh, thanks so much. That was such a great talk. Um, I was just curious about how you think about treatment in terms of symptom recurrence and what maintenance treatment you think will look like in the future sort of after the 12 month follow-up. Yeah, that, that's a terrific question. So one of the things that the FDA has asked us to do on a phase four level is that we need to try to figure out who are gonna be the responders and who are the non-responders. How do we sort that out? And then also who's gonna relapse and how do we predict relapse and what can we do? We, we've had one study earlier with phase two where we called it the relapse study. People do sometimes relapse. Um, life keeps presenting more traumas. Most time we find that people are, are um, develop a resilience and ability to process future trauma. We, we, we had um, one of the, John Lubecki, who I um, used his quote and his picture, um, after he was through the therapy, um, he had um, two people uh, unbelievably die in his arms. Uh, one person was a landscaper that fell into a lake behind his house, trapped by the mower. He administered mouth to mouth and the guy died in his arms. The other one was, um, months later and he was at um, an event, he went outside and there was somebody on the ground that was um, uh, being administered CPR by somebody he came over. It turned out that person had been shot twice by a drive-by shooter and he tried to save that person's life and he couldn't. And um, both of those times he thought he would have nightmares at the night, but, but he managed to process that trauma. He called Michael Mithofer and I when that happened. So most of the time people are, are resilient to future trauma. Sometimes people do relapse. So we gave one session more to these three people that relapsed. All three of them dipped below the level of having a diagnosis of PTSD, but then two of those people relapsed again. One of them was a woman living in her car who was living in a very stressful situation. The other one just barely went over the diagnosis of having PTSD, but still was a lot lower than she had before. So I, I think that there could be um, some sort of, um, program where people, when they do have these relapses, they come for one more MDMA session. Um, I know that Atai, which is a big holding company and Compass Pathways, which is uh, the psilocybin, they're talking about digital technologies that maybe will help predict when people are getting closer to a relapse. I, I don't know if that's gonna be workful for PTSD. They think that they can predict that with depression, but I think that is gonna be one of the big issues for us, but it does seem like, um, you know, one more session in, in many cases can be all that people need. Thank you, great. Um, I think Dr. Morell, if you don't mind coming on, you had a question. Sure, can you, can you hear or see me? Yeah, yeah, both. <laughs> hi. hi, Rick, really, really inspiring work. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, do you know, is there data, or I'm sure this is something I'm sure you, you considered, uh, for whether just MDMA alone yeah. uh, is effective in PTSD. I, I know it goes against the idea of the whole oh. point is you're, you're helping them work through something, but it would be interesting to know if might it be effective on its own to some degree? Well, yes, the answer is yes, it would. Um, I think that um, of all the psychedelics, MDMA is the most inherently therapeutic. But let me give you an example. So this is about um, more than 10 years ago. Um, two women called us 
within the same week with the same story. Both of them had taken MDMA at a rave, at a party setting. One of them said, so this is sort of MDMA on its own without therapy. One of them said, I remembered um, having been uh, sexually assaulted. It was a prior trauma. I was with a bunch of friends. They didn't want to talk about it because that, you know, they just wanted to party. And so I stuffed my feelings down and that was months later. And now I feel worse. The MDMA made me feel worse because it brought things to the surface and I wasn't ready to deal with it. This other woman said, I went to this party with a girlfriend. We took MDMA together. I remembered uh, having been raped in this prior trauma. And with my girlfriend and I, we went off to the corner and um, I'm not sure what that is. We went off to the corner and um, we talked it out and um, I feel better now. <laughs> so yeah. MDMA helped me. So I think that um, a lot of people report taking MDMA without therapists. Uh, there's ethical issues though. When you have severe trauma, we don't want people to be just taking MDMA on your own. So we don't think it'll be a take-home drug, but the study with Ben Kelmendi at Yale is the closest that we thought we can do ethically to see what does MDMA do by itself. So they will not give a supplemental dose. They will give one prep session. The PTSD patient will get um, MDMA. The, they only spend an hour in the scanner. There'll be four or more hours that they'll be with people that we have trained that are gonna be talking to them about what's happening. There's only one sort of integrative session afterwards. And we're using the caps in that, or, or Ben is using the caps. So, but, but I do have ethical concerns about just saying, oh, here's a drug, take it on your own. and you know, and the, the more severe the PTSD, the, the more the ethical concerns, I think, come to. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm even thinking that, the, you know, the S-ketamine model where it's under REMS, they come to a certified clinic, they're dosed, they're observed for a number of hours, but there's no therapy per se. You know? Yeah. I, I think it's more effective with therapy, but, but I, I do think from a cost perspective, in a way, that's what, where we're getting at is um, the group therapy. So that's why I really look forward to yeah. the group therapy project that you'll do because maybe that's a better way where there's a few therapists in there is there's people who have support from each other and it's still under direct supervision. But at the same time, I should say that um, in a licensed legalization system, this drug should not be illegal. People should have access to it with a pure drugs, honest drug education, harm reduction, treatment on demand, that I think that there'll be way more benefits than harms from just um, having people be able to explore and, and there's a lot of healing that does take place on, on your own, but, but still the more severe, the more important it is that it be supervised. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up we have Dr. Deckel. Uh, hi, thank you so much for speaking to us. It's an honor to be talking to you. Um, you. I'm a therapist and a psychiatrist do, uh, working with PTSD, complex PTSD, including also DID. And I'm wondering with the dissociation subtype, what kinds of dissociation measures you used? Uh, if some of them were multifactorial, like the DES or, you know, some, not just depersonalization measures, but more broadly dissociation measures. And if, if those data are gonna be available, like to look at the correlation between level of dissociation and um, outcome? Well, you have succeeded in going beyond my level of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and so we will oh, well. get back to you about which measure we used. Um, um, I'm not sure which it was. We, we do believe that MDMA can be very helpful for DID, but, that it, it, but it's gonna need more sessions potentially, more supervision. And so we didn't feel it was appropriate in this um, I, I would call it sort of a residential outpatient kind of setting. They do come in mm -hmm. for the eight hours, but then they go home. So I think it can be um, effective in DID. And that would be a very interesting research that we'd love to you know, collaborate on somehow or other. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll get back to you on which measure we used for- uh, I got some patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be very interesting. Similarly, um, at one point, Jeffrey Lieberman at, um, you know, he used to be the head of uh, the president of the American Psychiatric Association, head of psychiatry at Columbia. He's talked about an interest in MDMA and schizophrenia. Um, and, and Julie Holland, who's a psychiatrist, who's um, sort of went to medical school in order to study MDMA for schizophrenia. And we haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. but, but that's also something that I think is worth exploring, but only in an inpatient setting where you can supervise people more. But th there's a lot of potential. Thank you. Great. Next up, we have Dr. Schiller. Hi. Um, thank you for the great talk. 
Uh, I was wondering if there's a particular type of personality or traits or even some experience with therapy that would make some people more likely to have benefits from this type of treatment? Well, that, that's a really critical question that we don't have the answer to yet. So the thought was before we did uh, phase three was that the dissociative subtype would do worse, not better, that they, and they actually perform better. So um, we do exclude borderline personality Again, we think that um, borderline personality can be helped, but they might need more sessions to develop a good relationship with the therapists. Um, you know, th there are several cases where people have dropped out of the study in the MDMA group. It doesn't happen very often, but it's because the trauma was so difficult for them to address. Um, that for, um, and, and there's a personal choice. They weren't made worse off, but th there has to be this willingness to deal with painful emotions. And, if, uh, and the MDMA helps with that. But, but these were difficult situations. Well, I'll just be very quick. One was a guy who was uh, in prison for murder and he had been let out of prison for murder and he wanted to be in uh, MDMA therapy. He had terrible PTSD. He'd been abused by his father. And in a fight with his father, um, his father had a gun and they struggled. The gun went off, killed the father. So the story was that um, this was an accident and under MD and that's why he got out of prison after murder. Under the influence of MDMA, um, he came to the thought that um, maybe it wasn't entirely an accident. You know, Now he was out of jail on probation. He wasn't gonna go back to jail, but the thought that this could have been intentional to some extent was something he couldn't handle. Now, because it was in a protocol where we have to do MDMA once every three to five weeks, if it was in, real life treatment where he could have taken more time to integrate that understanding, maybe three months after his first MDMA experience, he would have been ready for another one. Um, so I, I don't know how that relates to personality types. The, the other person that dropped out was a Turkish guy who was in uh, our Swiss study and um, he was there because of a workplace accident and the person next to him had uh, died. Uh, he was the supervisor and then this part of Turkey where he was from, uh, sort of uh, village justice, if you are responsible for somebody's murder, then uh, death, then they, their family can kill you. And so that was where he started dealing with this, am I responsible for this person's death? And he couldn't handle that. So I, I think neither of these really answer your question about personality types, but we, we will be trying to figure that out, but we have not got any clues that so far. Very unfortunate. Uh, very unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, there's so many great questions in the chat. Um, hopefully we can talk about them tonight um, in the future. But thank you all so much. And thank you, Rick, for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And it's just so delightful to see the work that you're doing and the way that you're able to bring this inside this um, VA setting. And, and we hope that you will become this massive center to train therapists throughout the entire VA and really help us roll this out so that vets have more um, options and that fewer of them will be people that you've seen for 30 years or more and that uh, people can um, move back into their lives. Uh, we're, we're really so delightful to be partnering with you all. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rick. And to the audience, this was a fantastic attendance. And as Lauren said, we will be having a social hour at 5, 5.30. Yeah. Um, so please ask Lauren if you don't know how to access it. And again, Dr. Doblin, PhD from the Kennedy School of Government. <laughs> um, thank you so much for kicking off our lecture series and for all the work that you've done. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.